All right, the show is yours. Okay, thank you, Amanda. So first of all, um, I wanna thank uh, the people both in the room and also in the Zoom chat for appearing on the first like 55 to 60 degree um, day Saturday that we've had in a while to come see somebody who nobody's ever heard of um, do a reading and, and talk about writing um, when you're equally as qualified to do that probably <laughs> as I am. So so first of all, thank you folks who are uh, on the chat and also here in person. That's 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 really humbling even uh for someone like me who's who's local and and not you know household name by any stretch so so first off uh thank folks for for taking the time on an on a really nice saturday afternoon that's really that's really cool and and i'm honored and it means it means quite a lot uh by way of introduction just in terms of format um i, I know this is billed as an author talk uh slash workshop um for the workshop portion of it if people have uh, work that they want to send to me or work that they brought, I'm happy to take it uh, and review it and then meet later, either virtually or in person um, to, to, to actually workshop um, folks, folks uh, craft. So I'm happy to do that. Um, this is not really the, I didn't realize that we're going to be um, as virtual as we are. So today's the, not quite the format for that, but I'm happy to do it um, as we go forward. So I thought what I might do is um, tell you a bit about who I am and how I got here. And then I have some things to read. Um, and then <clears throat> to the extent that uh, folks wanna do Q and A, uh, I can do that as well. Uh, and, and then I'll, I'll really leave it, make it sort of audience driven after that uh, because you know you guys took the time out of your Saturday uh, to come here and see me. So. Uh, my name is Eric McKinley. Uh, I've been living in Kennett for four years and some change now, so I'm 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 still relatively new to Kennett. I'm from Philadelphia. Um, lived in Philadelphia the majority of my life, and then uh, you know life intervened and uh, ended up moving to Kennett. I uh, love it here. Love the library. I spent a lot of time in the library. I, uh, we we joke in my family about sort of the Kennett fixtures. There's the guy with the long beard and the hat who you might see walking around. There's like various people you might see running around. I think I've become like one of those Kennett fixtures. You might see me on a run. You probably see me at filter. You probably see me running around like who's that brown guy who's always around um, in Kennett. Um, that's me. So um, based on my relationship with the library, um, Amanda reached out and, and asked if uh, I would be willing to do an author talk. And I said, sure, I'm the author of two books. Um, this is one a novel called Blessed Sons, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, it's been published quite a long time ago now. It's uh, about 10 years ago now. And also the author of a book of short stories called Intrusion, which is what uh, partially I'll be reading from. Uh, and since the world has been ending the last two and a half years, uh, I took the opportunity uh, and time uh, working from home uh, which has sadly come to an end, but um, the time when I was working from home, I took the opportunity to write a third book um, called 1991, which uh, is ironically set in the year 1991. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll read from that. Uh, I'm gonna read a bit from that as well and just give a little background. Uh, so the three books, um, Blessed Sons, uh, so I'll, I'll go easiest to hardest. Uh, Intrusion is just short stories that I've written over the years that were compiled into a book. My publisher uh, wanted to do that and said, you know, give me what you got and I'll, we'll make a collection out of it. And so I did that. Um, and then after I did that, he said, you have anything else? And I was like, yeah, coincidentally, I have a novel that's been sitting in my drawer for a while. You can take a look at it. Uh, they said, sure. I gave it to them. They said, we really like this. We're going to publish it. I said, great have at it um so they did so they did um it's been fairly well received it's exceeded my expectations in terms it has it's not obviously well known it's not an international bestseller or anything but it's on the shelves in places it's on the shelf here at the kennett library and people bought it and every once and again although not for quite a long time now but every once and again i'll get a residual check so that's kind of nice um it's it was it's written um so it's it's time it's unfortunately the story a story that remains timely even though it's written before uh, many of the events that um, that it touches on. I don't know uh, if anyone on the chat or in the room has read the book. Has anybody in the room read the book? Uh, I know you read the book. Um, I'm partway through it. Okay, so so if you so if you think of um, the Trayvon Martin story or the Oscar Grant story or the or the 
um, Bernard Gatt's story in New York many years ago in the 80s, all those stories uh, involve um, the killing of uh, African-American young men uh, at the hands of non-African-American men. Um, and this book was written before, not before the Bernie Getz thing, but before uh, Trayvon Martin, before Oscar Grant, before all the stuff in Ferguson and um, uh, Floyd, before all of it. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's unfortunately still timely and, and, and more timely than ever. Uh, it's a story of three people, really. There are three characters that all intersect uh, the main the main three characters are Jarrell Walker, Saul Keenan, and Jonathan Blaylock. Uh, Jarrell Walker is a young high school student, uh, baseball player, scholar, on his way to Stanford. Uh, Saul Keenan is a st store owner uh, who is from the same neighborhood, uh, who ends up uh, killing Jarrell, shooting and killing Jarrell. And Jonathan Blaylock is the lawyer who represents Saul. They're all three from the same neighborhood in Southwest Philadelphia before the neighborhood uh, undiversified, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, and so it's about how they're the three, these three uh, men, young and old, white and black, how their lives intersect by this event. Um, and uh, the, the attorney, Blaylock, is uh, African-American. And so he's representing a white store owner who's charged with killing a black teenager who's on his way to Stanford and, and is very successful. And so uh, conflict ensues uh, based on that. Um, it's been, again, as I said, it's been pretty well received. It's been taught in some places uh, at a class at UVA, Stockton College, uh, a couple high schools um, taught it. So um, it's it's been well received. It's been here at the library for a while. I don't know if it's on the shelf today, but if, or if it's been taken out, I kind of keep track of it that mm -hmm. to the extent that I can. But but I think last time I looked, it was on the shelf. Um, but in any event, um, I'm not going to be reading from that today, uh, just because I it's a little I, it's a little heavy. Uh, so I, I and I took a look. I was saying to Amanda before we started, I took a look at a reading that I did that's actually on YouTube some years ago. And, and I thought, well, I'll just read what I read then um, for this. But I, when I read, when I watched myself reading it, I was like, I don't, I'm not in a good space to, to do that. So uh, I'm going to read some other stuff. Uh, I'm going to read um, two very short pieces from the short story collection. And then I'm going to read part of the first chapter of the new novel. Um, and I'll talk about that when I get to it. Uh, so the first, the first uh, reading from Intrusion is a short, very short one page story. Uh, most of these stories are um, not flash. If you've ever heard the term flash fiction, flash fiction is like really short, like half a page. Th these are not that. Um, these are a little longer than that, more traditional than that, but um, but they're short. Uh, this first, and I'm gonna try to get this, I mean, I'm gonna try to get this in the library as well. Um, so um, this is not as widely circulated as the novel, but I'll try to find some copies and get one here. You could even have this one if, uh, if, if I can't do that. Uh, so this first one is a short story called Aurora. It's very short. It's about, uh, loosely, it's about uh, a young man who just gets out of jail. He's on his way back home to uh, the person that he loves. So this is Aurora. It was so close to what the man told me, so close. He was my cellmate. He smelled like long dead trout. Every private act, every scratch, every piss, every stroke was in his presence for 10 months, for one bag of dope too many. It was my first time in, my celly a grizzled vet. At month, time, at month nine, he told me when my day came, outside would feel gentler, it would look kinder, it would smell fresher. I knew that last part was right. My day was yesterday. I wore my own clothes, my own shoes. I used the bathroom alone in a stall at KFC. I stopped there on my walk beyond the gate, pocketing the state's bus fare. The walk was long and cold. Released in the light, returned toward the dark. As I descended the hill to your apartment on Allen's Lane, the sun had set. And yet, a cascade sparkled in the Mount Airy sky, golden, crimson, orange, baby pink, ultra fine mist. It was so close to what the man had told me, so close. Except he didn't know that once down the hill with the dancing skylight at my back, 
I would stand on your stoop. I would see you draw back a sheer curtain watching for my footsteps. You would open, let me in. And yeah, while outside was gentler, kinder, fresher, inside with you was freedom. So that's Aurora. Um, the second one, uh, thematically, I realize is um, a short, really short story called Pop Speak. Uh, it's about a father and a son. Uh, in the first uh, chapter of the new novel, 1991, that, that book is very much about a father and a son, but uh, I'll talk about that when we get there. Um, so this, this story is a little longer than that. Aurora is only one page story. This is about four pages. It's still a little longer. Um, so this is Pop Speak. This is a young man who goes to visit his dying father in the hospital. Pop Speak. The two men met up today. They did so about once a year. Sometimes more than a full year passed, but the point was always made for them to see each other. They had to have the meetings. Any one of them could have been the last. It hadn't always been this way, but by now they had been through some cycles. You look taller, the first man said. That's because you're lying on your back. Fair enough, the first man said. You look good though. Yeah, thanks. I wish we could say the same for you. The second man sat. He had said we, despite the fact that he had come there alone. The second man was a spitting image of his mother. He was a professor, but he was awkward in conversation. And this way, he was like his father. So how are you feeling? The second man said. I'm feeling with my hands, just like always. That's an old joke, Pop. I'm an old man. A nurse came into the room to check what nurses check. Fluids, levels, comfort. This last piece was in limited supply. The nurse was smiley, conventionally cute. She had a smart brunette bob and was one of the few who could fill out scrubs. When she asked the first man how he felt, he did not reply with a lame bit. He answered, I'm fair, a little better since my son here came to visit. Well then, that's good, the nurse said. I'll be back with your meds in a half an hour. Ring if you need anything before then. I sure will, the father said. The nurse said hello to the son. Her smile was in overdrive. She far surpassed what one would expect in a city hospital. The son nodded and offered the politest thanks for her work. Then the men were alone again. Nice girl, the father said. She reminds me of your first wife. The son didn't answer. He stared at the television suspended from the aged white ceiling. It was early evening, so he was staring at the local news. The lead story was about the weather. It was a slow news day. So really, how are you feeling? Well, other than my heart and my lungs, I feel fine. The son shook his head, they paused. Both men looked up at the news. It told them nothing that was actually new. If they watched intently, the volume was low. The son could hear his father's quiet wheezing. After a commercial for insurance, the news went to sports. They're gonna stink this year. They might make a run, the son said. Yeah, and I might get up from here and make a run. Maybe a marathon. I know, I'll, all right, Pop. I'm just saying they're gonna be God awful this season. But maybe not. It's not like anyone else is so much better. They paused. That's true, the father said, although a real quarterback would help. Yeah, said the son, one would. Another pause. See, we agree on something. The son gave a skeptical chuckle. How's your work, the father asked. It doesn't change. Students come, they go. New girls every year though, the father lowered his voice as if others were listening, pop. I'm just saying, at least you have co-eds to look at, you know, so it can't be all bad. Co-eds, Pop? What, what did I say? Nothing, don't worry about it. The father coughed and coughed. He hacked for an easy 15 seconds. Through the rise and fall of phlegm, he said, Jesus, I thought I was supposed to be the negative one. The son didn't answer. He poured his father a plastic cup of water from the beige hospital issued pitcher. He set them both on the bedside table. He did so knowing that eight ounces of ice water were no match for the decades of smoke and bourbon. It was a gesture and collecting himself as well as he could, the father was grateful. The son had had enough. 
He was ready to restart the cycle. I'm gonna get going. All right. The son waited for the rest of his father's response. He knew it would come. You know, we can see each other more when I'm healthy. We don't always have to wait till I'm laid up. I agree, we don't. The father coughed again. How about that? We agreed twice in one day. The son said, when you're on your feet, feeling up to it, you know where to find me. They paused. The son made no effort to leave besides standing. He hovered over the bed. Is your mother going to see me? The son felt the pang of something, maybe mercy. I'm not sure, probably. It's okay if she doesn't. You can tell her that. If I talk to her, the son said. The father smiled. I'm a bastard, he said, but you've learned from me. The son didn't answer. He held, a head, he held his hand on the edge of the bed. The father cleared his throat. When he spoke, his throat was blocked again. Maybe you've learned from me how not to be. The son just looked at him. That wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, said the father. The two men met up today. They did so about once a year, sometimes more than a full year passed. The son moved his hand from the bed to his father's forearm. I love you, Pop. Yeah, you too, kid. So that's Pop's week. Um, these are really old stories and I realized that we still need a, a legitimate quarterback. <laughs> and, um, and it's like the more things change, the more they stay the same. I talked about this being timely, but that's still timely as well. Um, so a little bit about um, my background and how about the, the writing piece. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a um, criminal defense attorney by trade, uh, but a writer by passion uh, and always have wanted to write and always have written since I was a little kid um, and sometimes take detours from practicing law to do some writing, um, which is how these books and stories get written. Um, I a, quite a long time ago, I uh, thought I would leave the law full time and decided to apply to MFA programs. So I applied to like the top five MFA programs in the country uh, and got into uh, zero of them. <laughs> and so, but I didn't know, I thought I can get into one, I can get into one, um, but I got into zero of them. Uh, and so Rosemont College, which is, you know, local or was local for me in Philly, uh, has an MFA program. I thought, all right, I can apply there. I can go part-time and I can still work and, you know, an MFA is an MFA. And so I did that uh, and they, I got in. <laughs> and, and so, <clears throat> pardon me, that's where I went. Uh, and so uh, and that's, that's how a lot of this work has been born uh, through that. Obviously you have to develop a portfolio while you're going through an MFA program. You have to be writing because you're taking classes where you're expected to turn in work. Um, so, the novel was actually essentially done uh, before I even applied to Rosemont. Um, but it's none of the, most of the stories weren't done. Most of the stories were, were through workshops through, through the MFA. Um, so the last uh, bit um, thing that I'm gonna read and then, and then I'll, I'm happy to take questions both virtually and, and here in the room is uh, I'm really happy and really, really excited about this new uh, project. Uh, it's called 1991. It's set in the year 1991. I've been feeling really nostalgic um, just with COVID and uh, George Floyd and er, just everything in the world, Trump and just everything in the world. I've been really nostalgic for the 90s. Um, <laughs> I, I was in college in the, in the 90s and, and um, I graduated from high school in 1991. And um, I just been really wishing it was that time, uh, to be honest. And so I decided to immerse myself in that time. Um, and it was fun. And I would, would like to go back there, actually. Um, but in any event, um, so I so 1991 is uh, I had to do a what's called a pitch uh, for a publisher. We had to come up with a this meets that. Your story is this meets that. So uh, the pitch that I came up with was uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air meets uh, The Catcher in the Rye. Uh, it's a story of um, a young man named Langston English who graduates from high school. He goes to Central High School in Philadelphia. He graduates from high school uh, in 1991 and goes to college. So. 
the novel, the structure of it is uh, by each by each month, January, February, March, and it goes all the way through. It, the opening scene is New Year's Eve. Um, and then the last scene is uh, uh, New Year's Eve, I guess, 1990 turning into 91. And then the last scene is just before Christmas in 1991. It takes you through his senior year of high school and the beginning, his first semester of his freshman year of college uh, and all the things that come along with that pivotal year in, in many people's lives as they you know transition into their first step into real adulthood. Um, Langston is a uh, product of uh, very, um, he's a product of West Philadelphia and he lives um, with a single father uh, who raises him, but he's sort of um, the last sort of wave of latchkey kids because uh, he's kind of, he's also kind of raising himself uh, in a way, but his father is very good and supportive uh, and it takes you through sort of his relationships with his friends, him trying to navigate um, different situations with young ladies, uh, trying to pick a college. Uh, there's a road trip across country involved. Um, there's a lot involved and, it, and it's, it was a lot of fun to write and a lot of fun to go back to that time. Uh, and so I'll, I'll read a bit of that now. Uh, not, I'm just gonna read the for a bit of the first chapter of January, is, which is January, uh, not, not a lot, because uh, then I wanna open it up, uh, but I'll read a bit. Uh, so this is, uh, so the opening scene is uh, New Year's Eve, uh, 1990, going into, just before midnight, going into 1991, Langston uh, and his father, whose name is Crispus. I did whatever, what every 17-year-old want to be cool, middle of the social ladder, soon to be medium man on campus does as one year passed into the next. I went to church with my father. It wasn't all bad. White candles and moonlight illumined the chapel. Stained glass portraits casted faint shadows down through the pews. The place was beautiful. We went to a Lutheran church. My mother's name is Mary. I didn't know where or how she was, but I knew she was okay. My pop told me that if anything happened to her, he would sense it and tell me right away. Christmas was always sensing stuff. He was into karma and other weirdness, but he was a good dude. As fathers went around my way, he was definitely in the 99th percentile. He was present. He, Caroline's not in the room, right? He was, <laughs> he was present. He gave a shit. I fully acknowledge that this is a low bar, but he was still way ahead of the curve. On this night, he believed that we should start the new year getting right with the Lord. We were up in there with nothing but old people, many of whom would be lucky to make it through the new year. But my man was unfazed. Pop had his head deep into the hymnal. Christmas and the elderly were leaning on the everlasting arms. I had other things on my mind, like Yvette Hardison and where we would end up, like the rest of hoop season, like the happy new year, high caliber gunshots we heard between verses right outside. The church was named Calvary. I was wishing for a cavalry. All my mind was college, Mary's whereabouts. Hey man, sing. Christmas elbowed me in the ribs, looking down at my hymnal on the page from three songs ago. You better act like you know, he said. Christmas didn't know the half of it. I was acting every day in damn near every situation. And whatever I was supposed to know, it was beyond me. I faked like I was singing. The church bells rang, the gunshots chilled, and the service ended. Walking home, Christmas had questions. You hungry? It's 1 a.m., Pop. That's not what I asked you. Christmas had this thing about me only answering the question that was asked, like he was preparing me for future interrogations or something. Maybe he was. Nah, I'm good, not hungry. He didn't follow up. Calvary was three blocks from our Chester Avenue row house. People were milling about, loud, laughing, and vibing. Cars rode by playing BBD or NWA, and it all felt normal while also feeling foreign. Anyway, I wasn't hungry. I wanted to get home, lie down, call Yvette, and tell her Happy New Year, sleep. Yvette's mom would probably answer, probably not put her daughter on the phone. The streets thinned out as we made our way back down the block. Pop, yeah? Didn't you have something better to do tonight? Something better? Yeah, better than eating leftover lo mein and making me go to church with you. I made you? 
Come on, Pop. He paused. What was the vet up to tonight? I'm not sure, I said. Also, that's not what I asked you. Yvette was even lamer than I was. At least I'd left the house to go to church. She was no doubt reading a book that wasn't for school or watching a movie that was funny, but could also make her cry. She had no business being home looking like Naomi Campbell, but that was how Yvette was. She hated parties and most people. She'd been the same since grade school, since we'd held hands at recess and no one dared to make fun of her. We got tight in the third grade when she punched me in the face over a game of Uno. When her mom brought her to my house to apologize, Crispus was mortified. You let a girl slide you? You don't know this girl, I said. Yvette and I got cool after that and stayed close from then on. Someone, somewhere in there, we shared our first kiss, staked our claims. So, I said, no, I didn't have anything better to do. This might be our last New Year's together. I'll stop there. Uh, so that's that's the first part of the first chapter of uh, 1991, uh, which I'm really, as I read it, it's been a while since I read it, and I never read it out loud before. And I'm really, I really, I'm really happy with it. I really like those these people. Um, so uh, that's it for the reading. I don't know. I can, let me see if there's anything. It doesn't look like there's anything on the chat. Uh, so are there questions or comments or workshopy kind of stuff or anything at all? The floor is open to. Anything, I'm happy to answer anything. I have a question as far as um, your approach to <coughs> writing a short story versus a novel, and are there sort of different rules or a different uh, mindset you have to be into or different structure? Mm -hmm. How does that work? Sure. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, there are differences. There are many differences. There's different mindset. There's different everything. A novel, you have to be willing to, you, I mean, you commit years of your life. Um, I committed years of my life to this. I committed the, in years of my life to 1991. I finished it. Um, I started it January 1st. Ironic, I mean, kind of ironically, I started January 1st of 2019 and I finished it July of last year. So two years, so two years and some change. It took me to get through the draft, the first draft, and then the second draft took, you know, another six months after that. Um, I've written short stories in an afternoon, where I, I I've had a spark of an idea, something that has happened, and I'm like, I'm gonna write about that, um, and then I've done it and it's done, and then it's just I'm editing it. Novels don't work that way, um, so that's that you know, so that's the major difference. So I'll give you some examples. So. Um, some of the stories are inspired by things that have happened to me personally. Some of the stories are inspired by things that are just happening around in the world. Some of the stories are about, I, oh, this would be a cool subject to write about. I'm going to craft a story around this. Uh, so it varies. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I, there's a story in the intrusion called Forbidden Drive. I don't know if you're familiar with Forbidden Drive in Philadelphia. It runs through, it's a, it's a, trail that runs through Fairmount Park um, from Chestnut Hill all the way down into Center City, really, but it, run, it runs through Fairmount Park. And there was a young woman who a lot of people run and walk their dogs, and it's a, um, it's a very popular trail. Uh, and some years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, there was a young woman who was running. She was a teacher. She had just moved to Philadelphia like f f a month before, maybe, and she was going for a run in Forbidden Drive and a branch of a tree fell and hit her in the head. She died. She was like 26 years old. And she was supposed to, she had moved from somewhere else and was about to start a job as a school teacher. And I, I ran in Forbidden Drive all the time um, because I lived very close to it. And I just thought, and you know, they had the little vigil set up for her. And I was just like, wow, like how, what kind of a crazy thing is that? This like 20 something year old woman who moved to Philadelphia just goes for a run and a branch falls from a tree and hits her in the head and kills her um so i wrote a short story about it because it just it just moved me so much that i was like i have to express something about this um because i was just so because i knew the area because i would run still continued to run in that on that trail and would run by the vigil and just and it just really was moving um so that's an example a second example is i <laughs> Pardon me. Um, one of the first short stories that I ever wrote that was published um, was a story about a friend of mine who I grew up with who was killed uh, by Philadelphia police um, in a shootout when I was in law school. 
Um, so my first year of law school, this guy who I was pretty close friends with um, was killed by police. Um, he was doing things he shouldn't have been doing, which is why he encountered the police in the first place. But it was, but we very much grew up together. Um, and I was obviously very moved by that and, and how our lives, I was a first year law student. So how our lives had diverged and how his life had ended. And I remember seeing him not long before that um, on, the, on the subway and just catching up with him and talking to him. And it was like maybe six months later, he was dead. So, um, you know, things of that sort. So, so, so some things write themselves, you know, now short stories can sometimes write themselves. Novels never write themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you got to put time, or at least for me, I don't know who that, who these people are who can just, John Grisham maybe, like, I don't know who these people are who just wake up and write novels, pump them out, but I, I get deep in and it takes me a long time. Do you know how they're going to end? Um... Well, 1991, I knew it was going to end. I knew it was going to end in December of 1991. I knew it was going to get, I knew it was New Year's to New Year's. So that much I knew. Um, I knew, um, I knew where the young man was going to go to college. I knew certain things that were going to happen to him. I knew he was going to take a road trip. I kind of plotted out what cities he was going to go to and where he was going to stop and how that was all going to play out. So I kind of knew what was going to happen in, in this guy um i didn't know how it was going to end i knew the beginning and middle and i knew the climax but i didn't know it's a trial um or actually i, I don't know if i want to spoil it but it it's there are legal proceedings um and um i didn't know how they would end um and i won't divulge how they end but i didn't know what would happen i didn't know how it would go um, but then it became clear to me what needed to happen um, as I got closer to the end. Um, but I, but that's so that's all I'll say about that actually, because I encourage you to get it from the Kennett Library, or <laughs> and it's also available on Amazon. Uh, so so feel free to read it. Um, I don't see anything else in the chat. Anything else here? Yes, sir. Well, first of all, thank you very much for for doing this. Yeah, thank you for being here. You. You've done what I aspire to do, which is figure out a way, in addition to my job, <coughs> to create something like this, write, to write a book. And so I, this may be a silly question, but as far as process, you talked about the time. I guess two questions. Is it for the daily thing where you have to go out of every day and mm -hmm. is it just write stuff for it, or do you use other tools that outline and keep track? Oh, uh, great question. Um, so it varies for me. Um, so I'll talk about process. I can't think and type fiction. If I'm doing an email or I'm doing work for my job or I'm doing something, shooting a note, I can type and think. If I'm writing a story where there are characters and I'm getting involved in their lives, I can't also type because I'm a terrible typist. So if I'm looking at the key keys, trying to figure out where the Z is, I can't also be thinking about what are the characters and emotions in this moment. So but as a result of that, I write everything by hand when I do, when I write anything. So this, all these stories, 1991 was all written by hand in notebooks. So the first draft was all handwritten. And then I go back and the second draft is me typing it. And obviously I'm editing and changing and revising as I go. So that's, that's, that's my process. I don't recommend that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not the most efficient process. It's not the most time, uh, time effective process, but I can't, I can't do it any other way. I can't, think and feel and get involved in the emotion of characters and the emotion of scenes and also type be typing and looking at a screen. I can't do both. Um, my brain just doesn't allow for it. So I wish it did. Uh, I would be pumping out stuff a lot faster, um, but, it, but it just doesn't, I can't do it. Um, my brain won't let me. So that's process. In terms of finding time and is it an everyday process? Um, no, I mean, I, you know, um, so 1991, I started J January 1st of 2019. It had been simmering. The idea had been simmering for a while. And then, you know, New Year's, New Year's resolution. I'm like, all right, I'm doing it. So we went to a store here on State Street. I've got a note. I bought a notebook and I was like, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm starting January. Here we go. And I didn't really have an outline. I just went. I had an outline in my head. I knew, I knew, you know, I knew January was New Year's Eve. I knew February was Valentine's Day. I knew March was whatever March is. I knew 
April and May was like, you're getting ready for high school graduation and the prom, I knew the prom was gonna be significant. June is graduation, July, the summer, he's getting ready to go. August, you're on your way down the road trip starts. Now he's on his way to college, August, he's at college. So that was very, I'm not gonna use the term easy, but that was very, um, that was a format that kind of helped me. It was like, okay, I could, this is not so bad. You know, I could, I could figure that out. I don't gotta figure out the transition. I know what's happening. You know, I know the graduation comes after the prom. Like I can do that, you know, I, even I could do that. So um, was it every day? No, I, I had written a bit and then I put it away for a while. But then when the pandemic hit, uh, I was like, I have all this free time. We're quarantined. I can't leave the house. At the er early stages of the pandemic, it was like, I have no excuse. Like, let me sit down and just get get into this. And so I did. And then, I, you know, I, I, then it was every day. I was writing every day at that point because I had the time. It's hard to find time. I mean, it, it's just difficult to do if you're working. You know, there are very few people who there's, you know, there's the one percenters of people who write who can support themselves on what on money that they make from writing. It's a very, very small percentage of people. It's an extraordinarily small percentage. So we got to work day jobs. Um, I was just doing it on Saturday, you know, but when pre pandemic, I would go to filter or wherever a coffee shop and just sit there for a few hours and see what came out. And then that was my day, you know. Um, so that's a bit about process and about how I do it. It was, it was not every day. It was just when I could find time. But then once we were quarantined at the very early stages of the pandemic, I was like, this is great. I can write every day. So I did. Mm -hmm. I would prefer there was no pandemic because um, I, I would have eventually finished the book anyway. Um, but it was nice to use it to my advantage. Anything else? folks? Any, any other questions or comments? Are there any like authors or books that you feel like influenced you? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> um, so there's a writer, I talk about him a lot whenever I'm asked this question. There's a writer named uh, John Edgar Weidman, who's a, who's a, so I went to the University of Pittsburgh and I'm from West Philadelphia. John Edgar Weidman is from, the, from Pittsburgh and went to Penn. Uh, so we have kind of a reverse, he's a lot older than I am. Uh, he's, I think he's about to turn 80. Uh, he's in his seventies for sure. Uh, he's written a ton of books. Um, his style is very different from mine. It's very stream of consciousness and, um, very different writing style, but he wrote a story, um, called, um, Doc Story, which is a story about a blind man playing basketball in Clark Park in West Philly. And there was a time in my life where I played basketball every single day in Clark Park. Um, for the summer between my sophomore and junior year of college, I played basketball in Clark Park every single day. And uh, he lived near there. Uh, he's a pretty well-known writer. He's won a bunch of awards. He taught at Penn for a while. He teaches at Brown now, I think I want to say. Uh, so when I read his stuff, I was like, man, this is, first of all, he's a phenomenal writer. Um, he's always kind of on the, not short list, but he's kind of on the longer list of, um, Nobel, Nobel prize for literature, um, authors. Have you heard, you've heard of, you've heard of him, John Edgar Wyman, you're an MFA student. I don't know. Well, I'm, an, I'm a CNF. In any event, <laughs> um, in any event, our styles are very different, um, he wrote a book called Philadelphia Fire, which is about um, the move uh, bombing, uh, loosely, loosely about the, it's a novel, but it's loosely about the move bombing and the journalists who, who African-American journalists who moves back home to Philadelphia from Greece after the move bombing, because he can't believe that like blocks of his city were burned down. Um, and then, you know, he's getting divorced and a bunch of things are happening. So that novel really, so Weidman like really was the, is the writer who I was like, all right, I'm gonna do, uh, this is all right. Like he was very inspiring to me because uh, he's brilliant and he, he and I share a lot of the same backstory. Uh, he, he's had a very charmed life, but also really tra a lot of tragedy. His, his brother went to prison for um, life and I think is still in prison for murder and his son went to prison for murder um, as well. Um, and he, he's a, he was a Rhodes Scholar the, not his son or his brother, his John Edgar Wyman was a Rhodes Scholar. So he's this guy who's a Rhodes Scholar whose brother was in prison for murder and whose son went to prison for murder. And he's like this well-renowned writer and scholar and, and professor and 
So like the juxtaposition of all these things, and that really resonated with me sort of in my own life. As I told you about, you know, my friend who was killed and things of that sort, like the juxtaposition of these like crazy things that happen when you are in, are in a position like that is kind of a, kind of a mind F um, for lack of a better word, a uh, better term. So Weidman um, is one who really, that, that he's always the first person I think of and mention. Um, I'm sure there's stuff from it. I'm sure, I'm sure there's stuff in his here in the library. I'd be surprised if there wasn't. Um, uh, and there are others. I mean, there are you know, like every young guy went through a Hemingway phase. And I went through, you know, you go through you go through phases. You know, um, so that's the that's the answer to that. I have another one. Sure. Um, you mentioned, and I'll, I'll sit here so you can see me. Okay. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier um, about the young woman who was killed by a mm -hmm. branch, like on, mm -hmm. on a run. So when something like that happens, and you feel really inspired, and you feel like compelled to write. What brought you to fiction rather than like creative nonfiction? Oh, good question. Um, I don't know how to write creative nonfiction. <laughs> That's what draws me to it. I mean, I'm not. It's just not how I. Um, I guess I could. I, I mean, I could if I wanted to. I just, you know, it, it's what what calls to you, what speaks to you. I mean, I guess it's creative nonfiction in a way. I mean, I wrote a story. You know, a young lady got hit in the head with a branch while running on Forbidden Drive. I wrote a story called Forbidden Drive about a girl who gets hit in the head with a branch while it's running, and about how what she's thinking. Of, the story, so the story is about what she's thinking about while she while she's running. She's about to start a new job. She's maybe going to break up with her boyfriend. She's got her earbuds in. She's listening to music. She's just like kind of get herself, you know, get to get herself together for a run. She's thinking about how she's going to set up her classroom in three weeks, all these things. And then in the next second, she's dead. So, so I, that was what I thought about. Like, like, man, like she was just out for a run. She was probably thinking about, she just moved to a new city. She's trying to get ready. You know, maybe she's breaking up with a boyfriend. Maybe she's, you know, worrying about being away from her parents for the first time, like whatever it is that, you know, a young person in that space would be mm -hmm. going through that was that was kind of the that was kind of what i thought about i was like what was she i wonder what Sorry, she was yes. thinking while she was running like right before she died like i wonder what was going on with her so I, that was why I wrote, that was how so that, i mean in a sense that's creative nonfiction. i mean in a sense um i don't know what she was thinking about obviously i never met the young lady i don't know so what she was thinking and how she was feeling is all fiction yeah. but it's based on a, something that actually occurred um so so I guess you could characterize, I mean, I guess if you wanted to, you could characterize that as creative nonfiction if you wanted to. Yeah, you have an argument for either way. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Is that in your short story? Yes, you know, right it's, yes it's in here. Yep. Cool. <laughs> Anything else? For, let me see. Yeah. Anyone else? Don't know someone else join. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go back to well, do we have any other questions for Eric? Okay. So I'll just say a little bit about the workshop piece uh, since we're wrapping, it seems like we're wrapping up here to the extent that you wanna um, um, send stuff or email stuff i'm happy to look at it i'm certainly not qualified to like you know you take my critique <laughs> with as many grains of salt as you want um but but i'm but i'm happy to help other people you know as we as we go um i don't know if, well know. actually real quick like how did you make time for your mfa yeah, that's a good question. I was a lot younger and I didn't have a family and I did it at night. Uh, I would work during the day and then Rosemont classes were all from six to nine. Mm -hmm. um, so I would work and then I would either drive or get on the train depending on my where I was living and what I was, you know, what I was up to. And I would go out to Rosemont and go to class and and then, and then, yeah, I did it at night. I did it slowly. You know, I did it part time. They had an option. You know, you could do it. You could do it at any we were all together. So there were people right out of college who were full-time. That was their master's program right out of college. And then they were adult, you know, adult adults who had jobs who did it, you know, at their own pace. There were, you know, housewives who did it on a more full-time basis. I did, I, you know, I did it. I, I took one, one, one class a semester, basically. 
Um, and then I, I doubled up in the summer because um, I had a little bit more time in the summer. I took, I, I worked, I was practicing law and I, that was one class a semester, I couldn't do more. But then when I had a, a job that was not practicing law at Penn and I could, I had a little more time on my hands. I wasn't, a, and it wasn't as stressful. So I could, I could do a little more, especially in the summer. So I would take like two classes. Um, and it took, as a two year program, it took me four years. So, I mean, it's actually less than two years. You could, if I was going full time, I could have knocked it out in less than two years, but it took me four years. I just wanted it. I just wanted to do it. I wanted the credential and, you know, I'm glad I got it. I'm glad I did it. it I don't, again, don't recommend it. Going, working full time and going to school at night from six to nine. Like, I don't, I don't, that was just a different time in my life. I could never do that now, but I did that then. I'm glad I did. I mean, I'm glad I did, but I wouldn't, I would not do it now. Yeah. If somebody recommended, I was just like, I'm good. I don't need the MFA. I'm cool. I'll just keep writing. Um, but then, I, you know, I was a lot younger. So I just, I had more energy to do it. So what kinds of things can you do, do you do, if you're writing about like heavy, dark topics, like what takes place? <coughs> less sense? Like, how do you take care of you? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I don't think that my writing is, I, I guess I've talked about people dying and getting shot and all kinds of stuff tonight, but I think my writing is kind of fun too. I mean, I think there's, I think there's, I mean, I'm not to, not to toot my own horn, but I, I think, I think the stuff I write is funny and, and entertaining and interesting. And um, I don't, I don't, I don't view it as dark, um, I guess like which maybe serious. says more about, which maybe says more about me than the writing. Um, but, um, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I try to take care of myself. I run and meditate and, you know, I, you know, try to be as healthy as I can. And you need space. You need, you need emotional space to write. You need energy. I mean, at least for me, I, I need energy to do it. I need to be in a good place to do it. I can't just, I'm not. I can get up and force myself to do many things every day, but writing is not one of them. I have to really want it. I have to really want it. Uh, it's not inspiration. I can do it if I'm not inspired, but I have to really, really want to sit with it. Because again, it's by it's like a pen and a paper. It's not like I'm just like I'm gonna just type my feelings. It's like I'm gonna really like sit down and like get deep inside these people, you know. And I have to like the people. I have to like the characters. Like I really like the characters in this book, and I really like the characters and. I really like the characters in 1991 more. I'm not, you shouldn't play favorites, but I like, I like Langston. I like, I like those people a lot more. Um, but I don't. But that's not. I mean, 1991 is not a some some stuff. Some stuff goes down, but it's not dark. I don't. I wouldn't consider it dark. There are some questions in the chat. Okay. Cool. Uh, can you see them? Or do you want me to read them? Uh, no, I think I can see them. Okay, cool. Has life and Kenneth inspired writings? Oh, that's a good one. I'll come back to that one. Do you feel like you learned a lot from MFA? Did it change the way you wrote? Did it help you tap into your creativity? These are good questions. I'll answer this first. Um, I'll answer the second questions first. This the last couple. Um, I learned a lot in the MFA program. Obviously, I mean, I took a lot of classes. I, as I said earlier, you have to be producing work, otherwise, you're not going to get an MFA. So you have to have work that you're producing for if you take a if you take a workshop you got to produce stuff so it can be workshops um now oh, to get into an mfa program and this goes to the question about did it change the way you write did it help you tap into your creativity to to even get into an mfa program you have to have at least a little bit of a portfolio to present so that they can evaluate whether or not they want to even accept you so um uh, i have written a I've written and published a couple, two or three, maybe short stories before I even applied to MFA programs. Um, and so I, and, and, and this, and Blessed Sons was, was, you know, it was a, not a great first draft, but it was done. It was a first draft of a novel it was done before I even applied. So um, I, so I, you know, I, I knew, you know, I could have written and published this book without an MFA. Uh, I knew that. So I don't think it changed the way I wrote. I think it, I think I had some, to, to be honest, I had some challenges in a couple courses with, um, I have a particular view, point of view and worldview and, you know, and, and sometimes the MFA programs, you know, the critique of MFA programs is they're highfalutin and they're all kind of the same. And 
they want everybody, they want everybody to read like certain things. And there's a, there's a, there's a knock on, you know, you, you have an MFA style. Um, and I don't think I really have an MFA style um, necessarily. I think good writing is good writing. I don't know what that is. Um, so I don't think it changed the way I wrote. Um, I also didn't, um, this is gonna sound, at the risk of sounding um, arrogant, um, I don't mean it th this way, but this is legitimately how I feel. I'm a good writer. I don't need other people to validate whether I can write or not, be they an MFA program or a publisher or agent or whoever. Like I know it's good because um, I read a lot. That's how I know it's good. I read a lot of books and I read a lot and I know good writing and not good writing. And so um, it didn't really change the way I wrote. It did help me tap into my creativity because you have to come up with stuff. It's like, if you have a story due next week, I can't just be like, all right, I don't feel like it. I got to write something and produce. I got to produce something. To, so it did help me tap into my creativity from that perspective because there was a mandate to produce stuff. Um, so yes, I do feel like I learned a lot. Um, I don't really feel like it changed the way I wrote. I write how I write. Although I did get guidance and 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 I did learn things about the craft, but I don't think it really changed the way I write in 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 mass. Uh, and it, yes, it did help me tap into my creativity because you're you're compelled, you're mandated to to produce stuff. So I had to. Um, now the second, the, the first question is: Has Kenneth inspired any writings yet? Um, not yet. Um, but I think about Kenneth a lot. I think about um, the juxtaposition between um, the fact that Kenneth is forty two percent Mexican. Um, and you only see, you don't, if you go up and down State Street, you might see a Mexican or two, uh, but you don't see a lot. And this town is almost half Mexican. Um, but I, um, but if you, if you go in different pockets of the, and it's only one square mile, right? It's a only, it's a one square mile town that's 42% Mexican. And you don't, you see Mexican people but you don't see Mexican people. It's like kind of a bizarre. I don't know if I don't know if other people feel that way, but I feel that way when I'm running around. Like I went for a run today, and I run on South the Street. It's called South Street. It's over by the Mexican um, the mushroom, one of the mushroom factories over there. I ran over there today, and it's just a exclusively Mexican neighborhood, you know. And it's like here's this exclusively Mexican neighborhood in a one square mile town that probably nobody knows about. And if I didn't run over here, I would never know about. And it just feels so different. And it's less than a mile from, you know, Tallulah's table. We're less than a mile away. It's like a totally different, it's very odd to me. Like, it's just, it's cool. Like, I, I think it's very cool. And I, and I do want to write something up, get it, tap into that and what that means and how that, like, what that means for all of us. Um, so that, so that's cool. And then, and then sort of on a lighter note, um, I always joke that, so I moved to Kenneth Square uh, for family reasons. I uh, met someone and got married and we have a family and, and my house is like an 80 sitcom. I say that all the time because if you know 80, if you know anything about 80 sitcoms like Mr. Belvedere, different strokes and sitcoms where these, there are these like, th this term didn't exist back then, but these blended families where people from like totally different cultures now somehow inhabit the same space and then like hijinks ensue and it can be very crazy sometimes and so my house very much resembles an 80s sitcom like I sometimes will like look at the, my house and be like this could be a set from a sitcom like this is a sick I'm living in a sitcom sometimes so that's not Kenneth inspired but it wouldn't it, it's happening in Kenneth and it wouldn't be happening if I wasn't in Kenneth so so I'm inspired by that those are the two things so I'm inspired by this this like sort of strange hidden population that is almost the majority of the people of the town that you don't ever see, which is really weird. Um, and I'm inspired by the fact that my house is an 80 sitcom a lot of times. Uh, so those are the two things that inspire me about Kenneth specifically. I don't know what, if anything will come of that ever, um, but, I, but I'm, those are the things that sort of bounce around in my head and I think about it. And um, maybe that'll produce some work one day, maybe, I don't know, who knows. Maybe if there's another quarantine, I can get I can get busy again, but I don't know. Cool. Well, if there are any other questions, otherwise we can wrap up. And if folks, you know, want to come up and chat, <coughs> worries. This was great. I want to say thank you again. I mean, I, I you know, it's 60 degrees outside and it's Saturday and I can't, I can't stress that enough. Like, yeah. not that you would come out if it, you probably wouldn't come out if it was like snowing and icy out. Probably would, nobody would be here. But 
be that as it may, um, you know, it's 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 very it's very. I mean, even though it's not a ton of people, it's very nice. I I, I really do, I really do appreciate it. it. It does mean a lot to me. So thank you all for coming, and thank for, thank you to the folks who are uh, on the on the virtual portion of this, and thank you for the questions. They were all really good. They were all really good questions. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh wait, is there another question? Others, oh, or is that yours? I think someone said it was a pleasure to hear your story. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. All okay. right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Well, now end the recording. Okay. Whatever it is. Excellent. Excellent.